throughout the history of the church has the leadership always lived up to its teaching? No. Some of you don't seem to know. No is the answer. <laughs> no is the answer. I mean, we've got, and I don't say this to criticize the leadership, we just need to know the reality, right? The history of the disciples of Christ is that the teaching is there, but the living up to the teaching, whether the people or the leadership, is not always stacking up. So, yes, and that's true. Popes and bishops and priests and cardinals and religious have not always lived up to the teachings of Christ. Neither, by the way, have the laity. But I'm just saying that there is this same inconsistency in our own lives now in the life of the church. We've got some bishops around the world now who are positively teaching false teaching. Like in Germany, I've mentioned this before, and using the path of synodality, which is a very legitimate path that the Holy Father has got us on, understood correctly, and asking or, or instructing their priests to bless homosexual unions. It can't happen. It cannot happen. And Christ teaches it very clearly, and St. Paul teaches it very clearly. It cannot happen. However, understanding the sinner and forgiving the sin and showing mercy, this is all part of Christ's teachings. It was, it was, and regardless whether it's homosexuality, adultery, fornication, theft, we love the sinner, we hate the sin. Love the sinner, hate the sin. It's always been the Catholic way. But it's sad when you've got various leaders. In the time of um, Henry VIII, 15, what was it, 1531, when the when Sir Thomas More and John Fisher, John Fisher was the, the became a cardinal later on, but there were 30 bishops in England, 30 bishops, and Henry VIII declared himself as the head of the church in England. Only one had the courage to stand up and say, no, it is not true. The Holy Father is the head of the church in England because the church is what we call a supranational organization. It is above the nation. It, it is the same church in every country, the Catholic Church, and it is, has one visible head on this earth, and it's the Holy Father, who is the successor of St. Peter. The other 29 remained silent, and actually signed the, the affirmation. So they lied, and sometimes this happens. So this is what I want to focus on now, is that how are we to know Thank God, Christ has given us the Holy Spirit to guide the church so that her teaching will be protected from moral and doctrinal error. And so this is the teaching office of the Holy Father and of the bishops in union with him, that the teaching of Christ is infallible. It remains unwavering. And while the teachings of the church will develop and go deeper, the teaching itself doesn't change. Even if the personal life of the one teaching it doesn't stack up to it. So, as St. Paul tells, and he gives a basis for this, he says, I think it was to the Corinthians, he says, if an angel of light comes and tells you, he says the devil can disguise himself as an angel of light. And he says, but if anyone comes to you teaching a different gospel, even if we ourselves come teaching a different gospel, ignore us. Because there was contention in the early Corinthian community. And St. Paul comes back, even if we ourselves come and tell you a different gospel, ignore us. This is the true gospel. So, thankfully, the Holy Spirit has indeed protected the church's teachings throughout the centuries notwithstanding the fact that there have been many false prophets in leadership roles to try and take it away. I mentioned the time of the Reformation. I mean, Martin Luther was one of the leaders of that, but of course influenced many, many others. A retired bishop in Australia said to me once that, uh, he said, Mark, 
The apostles have had their successes, so has Judas. You get that? So has Judas had his successes too. And that's sad reality, but it's true. It's true. So that's why we need to cling to the teachings of the church, the authentic teachings of the church. Not what this priest or that theologian or this or that bishop says. What is the authentic teachings of the church? And this is what our Lord is saying to his disciples. The Pharisees and the scribes occupy the chair of Moses. So be guided by what they say, and you must listen to it, but not by what they do, because of the inconsistency of their lives. And as our Lord tells us, you want to know a true shepherd? See the fruitfulness. Check the fruitfulness. You will know them by their fruit. You will know them by their fruit. Now, our Lord gives a few other little things there about why we shouldn't trust what he's talking to the Pharisees, about the Pharisees, like we're in the broader phylacteries. The broader phylactery is the, you know, that, I don't know if you've seen uh, some shows about Jesus and how the Jewish leaders would dress with those uh, veils over their head because you're supposed to cover your head when you're in the presence of God. And that's part of the Jewish faith. And the phylactery is the, um, the broad trimming that you would have. So the broader the trimming, of course, the more you stand out and that somehow, you know, make you, supposed to make you look more holy. The, the longer the tassels are meant to be a sign of the intensity of your prayer. So if you have longer tassels, it means your prayer is more fervent. Can you see the stupidity of it all? Yeah, exactly, as if your dress is going to change the nature of your prayer. But this is the sort of nonsense that was going on at that time. Taking the seats of honour, well, we all understand that, you know, wanting the front row of seats and so forth. Uh, then our Lord goes on to give them a few um, home truths, you know, about not calling rabbi, not calling father, not calling teacher. Here I want to make a distinction between Catholic thinking and some Protestant evangelical thinking. Because some people want to take the Bible in a literalist sense. And this is always a sure solution to getting into mistakes, getting into error. So, for instance, he says, you must call no one on earth your father, since you have only one father and he is in heaven. Now, I've met Protestant evangelicals, and they won't, I mean, I'll introduce myself to Father Mark, and they won't introduce, they won't call me Mark the Father because they just call me Mark, not to be familiar, but because they think it's against the true Christian faith to call me Father. And, and so what they don't understand is that Christ doesn't mean this in a literal sense. Why? How can we work that out? Well, for instance, when he is in the temple for three days, when he was 12, and his mother says, can't you, my son, why have you done this to us? Can't you see that your father and I have been upset looking for you. Jesus doesn't say, he's not my father. He says, did you not know I must be about my father's affairs? Hang on, it's your father's affairs, you know? It, he's letting them know God is my heavenly father. God is my heavenly father. And, and, the, and then, of course, he went and but submitted himself under their authority. We see later on in the gospel our Lord saying, which, which father of you having a son or daughter asks for an egg will hand him a scorpion. He calls them fathers. So our Lord doesn't mean this literally. Or for instance, teachers. He doesn't mean we've got a few teachers in our midst here. He said, it's not meant to be literal. Don't call anyone a teacher. I'll tell you what it's supposed to mean in a minute. Because for instance, when he's talking to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus was that disciple who came to see him by night for fear of the Jews. And he says to him, and you, a teacher in Israel, do not know these things? Our Lord himself uses the word. So he doesn't mean it literally. How does he mean it? He means we are fathers if we are teaching in the name of the Heavenly Father. If we are representing him. That's in, in, in the religious sense. Teachers, in the religious sense, insofar as we are teaching in the name of Christ. That's how it is to be understood, not in some kind of literal sense. 
and I haven't found them to go look at the, um, some of my textbooks to see other examples of use of rabbi. So this is important to work that out, to understand it, that the church, of, the church's teaching, the chair of Moses, is protected throughout the centuries. Thank God for that. Otherwise, we'll always be asking which of the church's teachings are to be relied on and which ones are not. Which ones are just simply, merely human opinion. Years ago, I came across the story about Cardinal John O'Connor, who was a Cardinal of New York. And back in the, I think the 80s it was, probably late 70s, 80s, even early 90s. And he said the battles of the future of the church will not be fought on some moral issue like homosexuality or gay marriage, something like that. It won't even be fought on doctrinal issue, such as, for instance, women's ordination, which is definitive teaching. The future of the church's battles will be on the divinity of Jesus Christ. Is Jesus truly divine, or is he just a human being? And why is that such an important distinction? And I think he's right, and he's prophetic in what he said. Because if Jesus is just a human being, then his opinions can be mistaken, right? Absolutely. He's just another philosopher. He's an Aristotle, a Plato, a Thomas Aquinas, a Scotus, whoever, a Descartes, a Kant. He said he's a wise man. But if he's God, then he not only cannot be mistaken, but it means his teachings are right in all times and seasons. Understood correctly, of course. And there's many that have misunderstood the teachings of Jesus. A couple of weeks ago, we had our parish meeting, and I made reference to it in one part of it last week, the Membership Engagement 25 survey, and gave some feedback about that. The other part of the meeting we talked about was our finances, our, our financial situation in our parish, and particularly the concept of sacrificial giving. So over the next three weeks, I'm going to make reference to this and just develop the theme uh, in a, a bit deeper as we go along. And Alison did a great job just putting up the figures on the screen there, showing us what uh, where our situation is. But we'll go into some more of those details in the coming weeks. But some of you might think, well, priests shouldn't be talking about money in the church. Well, I disagree. Why? Not to be contrary, but because there is a spiritual law between money and God. You see, we care a lot about the things that we own, and that is understandable because we work hard for them. We we sacrifice for them, and so we value them. But, Jesus also says, you cannot have love God and mammon, or money, material things. In other words, we will love one master and hate the second, or despise the first and love the second. In other words, if we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and remember, as we talked last week, all that we have ultimately has come to us from God, even though we have worked for it in a short sense. Ultimately, it all belongs to God. And so if our hearts are attached more to what we own, and money is really just a part of that, then it ought to raise questions for us about where our true allegiance really lies. See, sacrificial giving is about where we see ourselves in terms of the body of Christ. Where we see ourselves in terms of what we are participating in. So it might help for us to recognize what is it that we receive by being a part of the parish. We receive the body and blood of Jesus every time we come to Mass which is priceless. We receive the light and the nourishment 
and the conservation and the peace that comes to us from basing our lives on the Word of God and letting that speak to us. That is priceless. We can't buy that. We get to participate in the life of a community that cares about us. That if we're not here, someone will ask, where have you been? I've missed you the last few weeks. I've been thinking of that. Give you a phone call. That is priceless. We get an opportunity to have our sins forgiven through the sacrament of confession. That is priceless. One of the things that sometimes brings a, a, a smile to my face when families or couples ask, how much does it cost to have a baptism in your church? And, or how much does it cost to have a, a wedding in your church? And say, you couldn't afford it, don't worry. It's priceless. Anyway, they look at me as if I'm serious. You know, I say, I'm just joking. But I say, what you're receiving is a spiritual gift. It's priceless. You can't put a finger on it. You see, but they're not thinking in that way. Because when many people come to the church wanting the sacraments, they don't really understand, most of them, in a profound way, what it is that they're asking. So rather than giving them a figure, which I never do, I say to them, you know what? You are receiving something priceless, something amazing. And to try and put a figure on it would be to insult the gift. And it is right that you should give something as an acknowledgement, as a, a gesture of your own gratitude for what you will receive or your child will receive. But then I also say to them, you go away and think about this and pray about it. And I want you to ask yourself, what would be something meaningful that I can give as a sign of appreciation for what you will receive? And whatever that gift is, I will be very happy. Because it's not coming from your head, or so much from your pocket, even though it is, it's coming to me from your heart. And if it's genuinely from your heart, then it is beautiful and acceptable to me. Sacrificial giving is about giving from our heart. Our Lord, you might remember in that passage in the Gospel, where he sees, he stares sitting at the temple treasury and watching many of the wealthy giving loads of money. But they were giving money that is in excess on the other hand, he sees the poor woman dropping in two small coins, less than a penny, the evangelist tells us. And he says, he calls his disciples together. He says, guys, see that woman? She's given more than all the others. Now, obviously, it wasn't materially more, but she'd given from her heart. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Well, how does that translate to paying the bills and, and paying the water rates and all that? I'll talk about that more later on. But if our giving is truly from our heart, then it is sacrificial because we give deeply. We give deeply. And that's what it's about. And then I'll talk about some practical ways in which we can do that. One final image that I hope will speak to you is this. The difference, the one who rents and the one who owns their own home. The one who rents is interested in paying the rent. They don't care so much about the home because it's the landlord, landowner or landlord whose job it is to look after that. As long as the tenant keeps paying the landlord, that's, that's their job. They, they have a roof over their head. On the other hand, landowner, if they care about the house, they will maintain it. They will look after things. They will make sure that things are in a coat of paint or something like that. Things are replaced. Now, of course, I know the analogy always breaks down because it's not a perfect thing. There are tenants who tremendously look after their home, and there are landowners who couldn't give or whatever, particularly in our present climate, because the, the uh, things are so hard and, and so much need for housing. But the analogy, I think, still stands. And try and see it for what it is. 
The owning of the house now that I'm talking about is the house of our parish. It belongs to all of us. Am I just a tenant in my parish? Or am I an owner? Do I buy into our house? Or am I just coming and going as I do as a tenant? This is what I want to leave you with in terms of sacrificial giving.